Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I'm Amaria. I pray that you are holding on to faith, Amuna, and holding on to hope during these times. Thank you for joining me once again for another session of our Sunrise Manna. And in today's session of our Sunrise Manna, we're going to be having a bit of an addition to a series that we began sometime last year or the year before. It was our Be Careful series or Be Careful What You Eat, Be Careful What You Say, Be Careful What You Think, and also Be Careful What You See. And we also discussed in our series, Be Careful Who You Hang Around, Who Are Your Friends, and Be Careful What You Hear. Well, we're going to be having an addition to our spiritual warfare series where we guard our gates. We're talking about guarding our gates from entry points that the enemy may have to enter into our lives and to come in and wreak havoc with our lives. But today we're going to be talking about guarding your gates. Be careful of your heart. Grudges. Holding grudges. There are some of us who hold grudges against ourselves even, against others, against mother, father, sister, brother, friend, people in the awakening, people outside the awakening, Gentiles. We hold grudges sometimes in our hearts and it creates an environment for the enemy to come in and, as I stated, wreak havoc. But also it creates an environment where there is a wound that will not heal. Imagine a wound and imagine the need for that wound to heal. The best thing that to do for that wound, beside putting on antibiotic, is to expose it to the light of day. If you put a bandage on it and just leave the bandage on forever, the wound will not heal because it will be too moist under the bandage. So you need to allow it to be exposed to the light of day. And so for those who hold grudges, that is the problem. The issue, the hurt, the pain, the woe is not exposed to the light of day, to the light of Yahuwah's countenance, and therefore it festers. So we're going to be talking today about holding grudges. And I want to remind you that a thankful heart harbors no ill will, not for itself, not for anyone else, even its enemy. And that is the kind of heart the Father wants us to have. He wants us to have a thankful heart. But unfortunately, even though the Father is so good to us and he gives us so much, there are times when we have things happen to us, things that hurt us, things that disappoint us, people who come into our lives or people who were born into our lives, our mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers, our cousins and uncles, and they may say something that is for us, unthinkable, untenable, unforgivable, and we hold on to it, and we can't let it go. And so it becomes a wound in our hearts that festers, and it will not heal because it will not, cannot, has not been exposed to the light of day, to the light of Yahuwah's countenance. And so we worry. We think to ourselves sometimes, perhaps I should let this go. Perhaps I should forgive. No, I can't forgive. But maybe I should. But no, I can't forgive. Look at what they did to me. You know what they did to me? I can't let it go. And so it creates this tug of war within our own heart sometimes because at times we want to let go of the grudge. At other times, we don't want to let it go at all. We want to hold on to it as if it were our best friend. We read in Moshley, Chapter 19, verse 11, it says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense. Sometimes when I was growing up, my mom would say, Girl, do you have any good sense? (laughs) And so the father wants us, his children, to have good sense. Good sense makes someone slow to anger, but also able to overlook an offense. Offenses will come, beloved. Somebody's going to say something that you don't like or you don't appreciate or you don't agree with. Offenses will come. 
But we have to learn how to have thick enough skin where we allow it to gloss over us like water off of a duck's back. We also read in Mashli chapter 19, verses 17 through 18, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. I want to pause right here for a second, because sometimes when we think about who is our neighbor, we think about, oh, that person down the street. But right here in this verse of scripture, it's relating your neighbor to your brother. You shall not hate your brother, and you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. So your neighbor is your brother, okay? And if you see your neighbor, the person with whom you interact, as a brother, you will understand the responsibility to keep peace between you, even if it means that there has to be some distance for a time. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahuwah. So who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is your brother. Your neighbor is the son of your own people. And against them, you shall not bear a grudge. There are some of us within the awakening. There's a lot of angst and disagreements going on. We're giving each other the side eye like, yeah, I don't know about you. You know, I watch your channel. I don't agree with what you say. I don't approve of you. Or someone else within the awakening who may have said something or did something or or indicated something about you that you didn't appreciate. Are you going to hold a grudge? Some of us do. It is poisonous for us to do so. So we're going to talk about this today. And we're really going to allow the Father to offer as much of his wisdom as he will grant us on this topic of holding grudges. But first, let's define it. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of a grudge is, it's a verb that means being unwilling to give or admit something. It is also a noun that means a feeling of deep-seated resentment or ill will. Remember, a thankful heart harbors no ill will. Therefore, it harbors no grudges. Okay? And also, in dictionarycambridge.org, it says, a grudge is a noun or verb that means a strong feeling of anger and dislike for a person who you feel has treated you badly, or the act of not wanting to spend time or money on someone or something. Hallelujah. So oftentimes, when we hold a grudge against a person, it prevents us from spending love on that person. We withhold our love, our time, our money, our energy, our good feelings. We withhold all of the good things from that person because we are, quote unquote, mad at them. We are, quote unquote, angry with them. They've done something to hurt our feelings. Perhaps your husband said the wrong thing to you on that day, and now you're harboring ill will in your heart against him. And so as a result, you withhold your love. You will not spend love on him. You're withholding your love because he said the wrong thing. Sisters, sometimes our husbands say the wrong things, and sometimes we do too. And we have to learn to rise above the occasion and give and cut them some slack in the same way we want them to cut us some slack. So we're going to be reading this article from verywellmind.com, and it's entitled The Mental Health Effects of Holding a Grudge. Now we're going to be reading some excerpts from this article, and um, I thought it was very beneficial, so we're going to be delving into this a little bit today, and I pray that it is about a card to you as we explore these things. It's written by Sarah Van Buskirk. We see this little graphic here. It says, ways to let a grudge go. Accept what happened. Consider the role you played. Distract yourself with enjoyable activities. Practice empathy for all involved, including yourself. Don't judge yourself or your feelings. Set healthy boundaries. Those are all beneficial things. So we're going to continue reading this article. And it begins, holding a grudge is when you harbor anger bitterness, resentment, or other negative feelings long after someone has done something to hurt you. And that is the key. You may feel these things after someone hurts you or says something to you, betrays you, 
does something to really hurt you. You may feel anger, bitterness, resentment, or some other negative feeling. You may feel that. It is human nature, if you will, to feel a certain kind of way when you're treated a certain kind of way. But the problem with holding grudges is that you feel these things long after the event, maybe the next week, the next month, the next year. Some people hold on to grudges for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's like a cancer, just sitting in your body, doing you no good, but causing all sorts of negative consequences as a result. So we'll continue. Usually it's in response to something that's already occurred. Other times a grudge may develop after simply perceiving that someone is against you or means you harm, whether they do or actually don't, whether or not they actually do. Yes, this is very possible to feel that someone is against you. I perceive that you don't like me. I perceive that you think in this thought about me. And then now you develop this grudge against someone who has done you no wrong, but you think that they have done something against you because in that moment you're being insecure. You're not secure in the love of the father in you. So you're perceiving ill will from someone else. And sometimes brothers and sisters, this ill will is sourced in you. You don't like you. You don't approve of yourself. So you project feelings of negativity coming from others towards you when it's really feelings of negativity that you have for yourself. Continuing, grudges also often feature persistent rumination about the person or the incident at the center of your ill will. Now, you know what rumination is. Ruminating is going over it again and again and again. It's like a cow chewing the cud. The cow chews the cud, swallows the cud, and then regurgitates the, cu the cud, chews it some more, swallows the cud, regurgitates the cud, and just keeps chewing it and chewing it and chewing it until it's digested. But in this case, it never digests. The grudge is never digested. It just keeps being regurgitated and chewed again and again and again until there's a decision to let it go. You either decide to let it go or you die. Really, those are the two options. While we don't often like to admit it, Holding a grudge is a common way some people respond to feeling that they've been wronged. Yes, it is a very common way. This is typically what we do. It's human nature. But the Father is calling us to act in supernatural ways, not live according to human nature. If you're still mad, well after a precipitating incident, you may be holding on to those negative feelings for too long. Sometimes, well after other people typically would have let them go. You may remember multiple past bad acts and relive those experiences every time you think about or interact with that person, either making your displeasure abundantly clear to them or keeping your true feelings to yourself. You might be intentionally holding a grudge, but sometimes you aren't even aware of it. But whatever your intentions or the cause of your bitterness, holding a grudge can end up hurting you as much as the person who inspired it. Clinging to anger can impact you emotionally, physically, and socially. So it's important to learn to let go of your grudges and cope with anger in a healthier way. So I just wanted to briefly mention here that you might be intentionally holding a grudge, but sometimes you're not aware of it. And I think that that's an important point to hone in on for just a few minutes. Is it possible that you're angry with someone and that you're bearing a grudge for something that they did, perhaps they're not even aware that you're holding a grudge. Perhaps you're not aware either. But whenever you're around a certain person, you feel a certain kind of way. Maybe you put them off. Maybe you don't take their phone calls. Maybe you don't respond to their text messages. And when you do, it's with clipped responses like, yes, no, maybe so. You know, you really don't want to talk to them. And you're not quite sure why. They did something to you, and it offended you. It hurt you. But maybe you think you got over it, or maybe you think I wasn't offended, but maybe you were. So I encourage you, as we are going through this lesson today, to think 
about times when you may have been acting toward a person in a way that makes you go, why am I acting this way toward this person? Why does this person really get on my nerves? Why am I so annoyed whenever I'm around this person? Is it possible I'm holding a grudge against this person? And I pray that the Ruach would reveal to us all ways in which we're holding grudges against others and against ourselves. Continuing. Why we hold grudges. From early childhood on, holding a grudge is one way people respond to negative feelings and events. This reaction is particularly common when you think someone has done something intentionally, callously, or thoughtlessly to hurt you, especially if they don't seem to care or make an attempt to apologize or make the situation right. If you have low self-esteem, poor coping skills, were embarrassed by the hurt, and or have a short temper, you may even be more likely to hold a grudge. And what we're seeing here is the tendency toward holding a grudge is steeped in low self-esteem, poor coping skills, or in some way, shape, or form being repressed in a childlike stage. When your children, when we're children, we're very likely to hold a grudge. Think about a child who doesn't get what he or she wants and they decide to hold their breath. That's very much grudge-like behavior. That's what grudges do. People who hold grudges, it's like you're holding your breath to punish the other person, but you're really punishing yourself, okay? So you're saying, I'm going to hold my breath. I'm not going to breathe because you made me mad. But if you do that long enough, you're the one who dies. And so when we hold grudges, we withhold things from other people. But it ends up creating a situation where we're less for the event or for the action because we don't get to interact with the person that we really do care about. Because honestly, if you didn't care about the person, the fact that they hurt you wouldn't bother you in the least. If someone cut you off in traffic, it may annoy you, but you probably wouldn't carry a grudge for 20 years, right? Because you don't know that person. You don't care anything about that person for the most part. But if your mother or your brother says something about you that you don't like, you're going to carry that because you love them, because you care about them. Okay, So the fact that you have a grudge or holding a grudge demonstrates that there's some level of care that you have for this person for whom you're holding this grudge. And also this article is talking about poor coping skills. Sometimes we are repressed in our emotional intelligence. We are still acting as if we are 3, 5, 10, 12 years old, emotionally speaking. And we don't understand that when you're a child, you act like a child, you think like a child, you speak as a child. But when you become a man or a woman, you put away childish things. And holding grudges is on par with childish things. Because ultimately, the Father instructs us to love one another. And you cannot truly love if you're holding a grudge. And so I know it's difficult, but at the very least, there should be a willingness to say, you know what? I'm really hurt. This person hurt me. And when I look at them, it makes me so mad. I just want to spit, right? At least acknowledge it. Father, I have a grudge against this person, or I have an offense against that person. Please help me. Help me to deal with it instead of ignoring it and pretending that it doesn't exist. And if you were embarrassed by it, or if you already have low self-esteem, if you already don't have a good feeling about yourself, somebody saying something about you that you don't like, say for instance, in my family, we're very honest. That's how I grew up. If you had put on some weight and you showed up at a family event, the first thing you're going to hear is, boy, you sure got fat. Or boy, you put on some weight there. Oh, look at your behind. I'm telling you, it's probably going to be the first thing. Not, how are you doing? I hadn't seen you in 12 years. It's going to be, boy, you put on some weight, right? It's going to be the first thing. Now, they may mean no harm by that, but it can be a hurtful thing because you may be thinking, you mean you hadn't seen me in five years and the first thing you think about is how much extra fat I have on my body? What about me? Don't you care about me? And so it may be a thoughtless thing for them to do or to say, it may be, really, for sure. But can you let it go? Can you say, well, it may be thoughtless, but 
I'm going to choose not to be offended or hurt by that. And so it all depends on your esteem. How do you feel about you? If you don't feel good about yourself, them saying that you put on weight is going to destroy you emotionally. You're going to feel horrible and you're going to carry a grudge for a long time unless you choose to let it go, that is. So let's continue on. While we all may fall into holding an occasional grudge, some people may be more prone to hanging on to resentment or anger than other people. Sometimes holding grudges and blaming others may be a form of self-protection. In the same vein, some people may be more cognizant that they are stoking feelings of bitterness than others, who may be unaware of the role they play in keeping their anger alive. Lasting bitterness can grow from a variety of issues, large and small as well. For instance, holding a grudge may come about as a result of seemingly small slights, such as someone not picking you for a team, taking your preferred seat, not including you on a group text, not inviting you to an event, calling you by the wrong name, not noticing your new haircut, looking at you in a strange way, or even simply bumping into you, okay? Now, these are pretty minor, <laughs> in my opinion. These are pretty minor reasons to hold a grudge. It seems to me like this is more on par with just an annoyance, right? But not necessarily a grudge. But if someone determines that they're going to hold a grudge for these events, this is petty indeed. I mean, really, these are really petty actions, okay? So, but I wanted to talk a second about self-protection because holding a grudge really is a form of self-protection. If you feel really low about yourself, or you feel very vulnerable, or you feel unloved, or you feel unlovable, and you perceive that someone around you thinks the same thing about you, what you need in that moment, according to your own sensibilities, is that you need to protect yourself. And so if someone gives you just the barest inkling that they're not for you, that they're not supportive of you, that they don't love you, that they don't esteem you, you are going to put up a wall to protect you from that person so that that person cannot hurt you anymore. In some cases, many cases, really holding a grudge is about self-protection. And so what you do is you create a wall between you and that person so that you don't have to experience any more hurt from that person or that they don't even have an opportunity to hurt you in the first place. Okay, It's not a healthy way to live. It's living within a walled off space, isolated from the people that, yes, they had a potential to hurt you, but they also have the potential to love you too. Continuing. Of course, resentment and prolonged anger more often spring from larger missteps, such as someone forgetting your birthday, not helping you when you need them, making a thoughtless or rude comment, or letting you down in another hurtful way. Grudges also naturally build from more egregious events like taking credit for your efforts at work, lying, false accusations, forgetting or ignoring something important, or making a pass at your significant other or the object of your crush. Okay, we're going to pause here for a second. Now, these are more significant reasons to hold a grudge if someone is going to hold a grudge. It makes a lot more sense that someone would hold a grudge if you took credit for something that they did or if you lied on them. If you said they said something that they didn't say, it would be very hurtful, very painful for someone, especially someone that you know very well, to accuse you of something that you didn't do, especially if they didn't come to you and ask you first. Did you say this? Did you do this? And they automatically assume, especially if they take other people side against you. That would be harmful. That would be hurtful, right? But still, you get to decide, I'm not going to allow this to affect my ruach. I'm not going to allow this to affect my shalom. It's hurtful. It's painful. But the Father's grace is sufficient. And the only reason we can be talking about these things in such a way that's not psychologically driven is that we have the ruach hakadash who helps us and we're going to be talking about these things from a more scriptural and spiritual perspective in just a bit. But for now, we're just talking about the problems that exist with regard to holding a grudge and why we would do it, okay? 
I think, for example, for me personally, when people take credit for things that they didn't do, that is one of my pet peeves. I believe in getting giving credit where credit's due. If someone did something, I believe you should say that person did it. If that person didn't do it, I think they should say, no, I didn't do it. This person did it. And it really, in the grand scheme of things, ultimately, the father deserves all the credit for everything, right? He deserves all the credit. But if you take credit for something that someone did and you have an opportunity to speak up, you shouldn't do that, okay? You should give credit where credit is due. Honor to whom honor is due, tribute to whom tribute is due. That's what the scripture says. And so we should, in the process of interacting with one another, not give occasion to people to be offended or to develop a grudge, okay? So for example, if the whole world is piling on to one person and saying, oh, did you hear? Did you hear? Such and such did a video. Such and such has a belief system. Such and such did such and such. And without even talking to that person, without checking out the video yourself, without watching it all the way through, you develop an opinion about that person, and then you start repeating what you hear. This is slander. And now you have to give an account to the Most High for what you're doing, because the Father will judge in the situation. But you can create a situation in someone else where now they could be offended, or they could hold a grudge because of what's happening to them, right? And so we should not give occasion to another person to bear a grudge or to be hurt or to be offended. We need to be well-reasoned. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be mindful. And we always, 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 family, need to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. We have to imagine, how would I feel if this were being said or done about me? How would I feel? How would it make me feel? And if you can imagine that it wouldn't make you feel good, don't do it. Don't do it. Not unless, of course, the Father's telling you, it's a hard word. I need you to give this person this hard word. And they may not like it, but I need you to give it anyway. Then you've got to obey the Father. You've got to. But I'm just talking about everyday living. We should not give occasion to our brothers and sisters to hold a grudge, if at all possible. Okay? And I'm not talking about walking on eggshells. Mm -mm. I don't think we should do that. I think that we should be honest and upfront and live in such a way before people that we can be honest and true, right? We shouldn't have to hold what we feel or believe, but whatever it is that we feel or whatever it is that we believe, we should demonstrate those things in a loving and caring manner, treating the other person the way we would want to be treated. It goes on to say, Additionally, sometimes you and the person you feel wronged you may both be holding grudges against each other, further exacerbating the cycle of bitterness, anger, and blame. Holding grudges is sometimes related to people's automatic negative thoughts and cognitive distortions. And it's true. We do have a tendency toward cognitive distortions. Sometimes I can see a situation or you can see a situation completely different than the way it actually is, right? We may. You may see it as being harmless. The other person may see it as being devastating. Like, oh, you just devastated me with your response. Oh, you just devastated me with how you behaved in that situation. And you may have said, I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't know what I did to hurt you. You may be completely unaware. So we all have a way of looking at situations that's based on our own trauma that we carry. That's based on our own history. That's based on our own thought patterns and our own ways of understanding and being in the world. We're all different, right? And so what could make someone laugh could offend another. So once we learn about the sensitivity levels of certain people in our lives, we have to make sure that we are aware of that, mindful of it, and treat them in a loving way, okay? Once again, not talking about walking on eggshells, but I am talking about being sensitive to the people that we love, okay? Continuing. Is holding a grudge harmful? Boy, is it. Essentially, holding a grudge isn't good for you, 
It ensnares you in anger and makes you prone to persistent rumination rather than moving forward with your life. Yes, it's like you get stuck. Like you're a truck stuck in the mud and you ain't going nowhere. You're not going forward. You're not going backwards. You're just stuck and you don't move forward. You don't grow. You're not growing in the most high. You're not growing spiritually. You're not growing emotionally. You're just stunted. You might think that harboring ill will harms the person you're mad at, but ultimately you're the one who suffers from it. Essentially, a grudge inhibits your ability to cope with or resolve your issues and keeps you stuck in the past, trapped in an unpleasant event or interaction that causes you distress. Imagine for all time being trapped in a feeling, a negative feeling that you had. Imagine your husband said something to really hurt your feelings and you don't let it go. Let's say that you don't let it go for three weeks. For three weeks of your life, you are trapped and stuck in an unpleasant emotion, going over it and over it again and again and again in your mind. That's three weeks of life that you are wasting, that you're not going to get back. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Some people say that holding a grudge or being angry or walking in unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping that the other person dies. And that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. You're angry, you're bitter, you're upset, but the other person, in many cases, they're fine, having a good old time, enjoying their lives. They've moved on, but you're still stuck in the mud, not moving on. There's a quote here by Lori Deshane. She says, we often hold a grudge because we don't want to let the other person off the hook. But who's really hooked? The one who's moved on or the one who's holding on? When you hold on to grudges, you are stuck and you're not moving on. You're the one who's being punished, not the person who hurt you. Continuing. The grudge doesn't solve your problem and is highly unlikely to make you feel any better. While it is certainly unhealthy to not feel or fully possess and accept your feelings, research shows that fixating on negative emotions rather than solving them is also harmful and can make for an unpleasant demeanor and substantially erode your well-being. Consider that the phrase holding a grudge comes from the old French word gruchier, which means to grumble and is related to the English word for grouch, ouch. Related other English and German words have similar meanings that translate into to complain, to wail, to grumble, to cry out. Clearly, holding a grudge can be detrimental and painful for the person holding it, just like the hurt that inspired it. You know, thinking about these words in these other languages, for example, Gruchier, which means to grumble. Imagine grumbling for 20 years or for three weeks or for 10 years. Imagine the sound of a grumble in your mind, but imagine it coming out of your mouth. For example, grumble, 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 grumble. Angrily, you're angry, you're hurt, you're frustrated about something that happened to you. And imagine it coming out of your mouth grumble, 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 grumble. So you're grumbling, but imagine that inside your head for a long time. Imagine the physiological effect that has on you. Imagine complaining, wailing, crying out for something that happened to you six years ago, but you're still feeling it as if it happened three minutes ago. This is not the Father's will for us. It's not. And that is why he told us to be quick to forgive. He knows the effect of the grumble, grumble, grumble. So he says, be quick to forgive. Hallelujah. Let's continue. Physical health effects. Studies show that holding on to anger rather than responding with forgiveness and or moving on can have profound negative physical health effects as well, likely due to the added stress harboring grudges creates. 
chronic stress can cause a range of adverse health effects on the body, including on cardiovascular health, digestion, reproduction, sleep, the immune system, headaches, insomnia, upset stomachs, heart disease, and asthma are all known to occur more commonly in those living under high levels of stress, particularly for those that don't respond well to change or difficult situations. Finding productive ways to release anger, frustration, and other forms of stress, such as letting go of grudges, may mitigate these symptoms. Absolutely. I want to go back to the list for a second. Cardiovascular health. That's your heart. So your heart is hurting, so your heart is affected. Digestion. You ever heard the phrase, what's eating you? Oftentimes, when people hold grudges, something is eating at them. And something's eating at you, and now you can't eat. Not properly, anyway. Your digestion is affected. Your reproduction. When you ruminate, you go over something over and over and over again. You're reproducing the thought. You're reproducing the feeling over and over and over again. And the negative reproduction of those thoughts affects your reproduction. Sleep. Oftentimes, you lose sleep thinking about all the negative things that may have happened or maybe you imagined happened to you. And as a result, your sleep is negatively affected. And when you are able to sleep, you don't sleep. You don't sleep well. The immune system. The immune system is the, your ability to defend against attacks that may come from the outside world. And spiritually speaking, brothers and sisters, when you hold a grudge, you open the door wide for the enemy to come in to attack you because your spiritual immune system has been shut down. You have just left the door wide open, wide open. So not only is your physical immunity affected, your spiritual immunity is affected because where there is anger and bitterness and malice and strife, every work of the enemy comes in. He comes in with one ruach. He comes in with a ruach of offense, okay? You're offended. You're holding a grudge because you're offended. And then you allow that ruach to settle into you. And then he says, <whistles> he calls his buddies. Hey, come on over here. There's a space for you to rest your head. And then before you know it, you've got all manner of negative ruachs who are inhabiting your space, who've now got a stronghold within you because you held a grudge because somebody said you were overweight. Maybe you are. Maybe you are. Maybe you aren't. It doesn't matter. What matters the most is living our lives to be pleasing to the Most High, not to please others. We're never, ever, ever going to please everybody, family, because someone on your left can be pleased with you, and then someone at your right hand at the same time can despise everything about you. You're never going to be able to please all the people all the time. So stop trying. Your delight and your responsibility should be to please the Most High. That is it. If other people are pleased along the way, fantastic. If they're not, fantastic. As long as the Most High is pleased, that's all that matters. Excess anger has also been shown to adversely impact cognition. That's the way you think. You don't think right when you're holding grudges, when you're holding on to negativity. You don't think right. You're not your right mind. Because in that moment, you don't have the mind of Messiah, the mind of Mashiach. You have the mind of the wicked one because the wicked one is influencing your thoughts because you have opened the door to allow wicked rocks to come in and inhabit your space space of your heart and executive function. So the ability for you to sit and make important decisions is affected by your holding to grudges and being offended by things that people say. In fact, one study found decision-making skills to become impaired in those with high levels of anger. Memory and perception of reality may also be negatively associated with holding grudges as well. And so this article goes on to 
discuss other things, but I'm ending it here. And if you are interested in reading more about holding grudges, I invite you to go to verywellmind.com and read the remainder of the article if you so desire. Long story short, excess of anger is a killer. So is holding grudges, holding bitterness, holding unforgiveness. They all go in the same category. It affects your heart. It's a heart issue, right? And so your heart then can't be pure before the Most High because you're holding on to something against your brother, against your sister, okay? So what does the Word, what does the Bible, what do the scriptures say about holding grudges? Well, I was hoping you'd ask. So let's get to the scriptures, okay? So we're reading today from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And it reads, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. We're going to pause right here. We're going to go back up where it says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. The scripture is telling us right here to speak the truth. Okay? Speak the truth. But there are certain things that don't need to be said. If you notice that someone has put on weight, you don't have to say that. You don't have to tell them that. They already know. Their clothes don't fit. They already know they put on weight. They don't need to hear it from you. Okay? There are certain things you need to hush your mouth about. It doesn't need to be said. You don't need to express everything you think and everything you feel especially if it has the potential to hurt another person. So we need to guard our mouths and not allow things to come out that's not lovely, that's not seasoned with salt, okay? But if someone says something to hurt your feelings, the scripture says, be angry, but sin not, okay? It is natural. It's a natural reaction to feel anger about certain things that happen, okay? But sin not. So we should not sin, as a result of our anger, and we should not let the sun go down on it. So let's say, for instance, somebody says something and it really hurt your feelings, and you're angry until just before sunset, and you go, you know what? Sunset's coming. I got to let this go. And you have to do that. You have to let it go. You've spent the day on it. Maybe you spent an hour on it. Maybe you spent six hours on it. But just at sunset, it's time to let that go. Because if you hold on to it till the next day, it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger in you. The father knows what he's doing. He's saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger, because if you do, you give opportunity and place to the wicked one. You have created an environment where he can cement that hurt in your heart, and you won't let it go. And it's going to be more and more difficult to let it go the longer you hold on to it. So at the end of the page, we read, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such is as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So let no corrupting talk, no corrupting communication come out of your mouth. Don't say things to hurt people's feelings. Don't. If you wouldn't want to hear it, don't say it to somebody else. Unless the Father commands you to speak, then you must speak. Okay? But not everybody speaks from the Ruach HaKadosh. Sometimes people purport to speak for the Father, but they're really speaking from their own mind because they want to say what they think. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what the Father says, okay? So as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men and don't say things to people that you know doesn't profit, okay? Don't. If you know someone's going through a hard time, be gentle with them. Be loving. And don't grieve the Ruach HaKadosh. Don't grieve him. Don't say things that you know is going to offend another person and get them trapped in offense. Because now you're going to be offending the Ruach who may live in them. Okay? Then now he's got an additional work that he needs to do in them because of something you said. Now, granted, 
he has a work to do in them anyway because they're in, they're in a position where they need to have their walk at work in their lives or else they wouldn't be or fall prey to these things, especially so often. But we all have work that has to be done in us, all of us. All of us are in a state of becoming what the Father wants us to be. We have not yet arrived, not yet. We're getting there, though. So the Father has sealed us unto the day of redemption by his Ruach. And so we should not lay a stumbling block before our brother. It goes on to say, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Yahuwah and Mashiach forgave you. We are to walk before the Most High without bitterness, without anger, without wrath. We're not to slander anyone or put anyone's reputation on the line by the things that we're saying about them. We're to be kind-hearted and tender-hearted and forgiving one another. And truly, brothers and sisters, we are to treat one another as we want to be treated. If we do that, it makes for much wonderful and awesome life in the Ruach, if we actually do it. But oftentimes we don't do it. And the minute something happens, the minute People are talking, and there's a clamor about something. Oh, have you heard? Have you heard? You jump on the man wagon oftentimes, and you don't stop to pray. You don't stop to say, Father, is this true? Should I believe this about this person? Should I even consider these things? But you go, have you heard? And then you spread the gossip, and now you're slandering your brother, slandering your sister. There's an account that has to be made for these things. So let us learn and let us become those who don't spread tales about anyone. And may we never treat another person the way we desire not to be treated. Continuing. Matayahu chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours, your trespasses. So there's another reason to let go of grudges. To hold on to a grudge is to hold on to unforgiveness. That's plain and simple. You have decided, for whatever reason, not to forgive your brother or sister for hurting you, whether that hurt is real or imagined. For whatever reason, you have determined not to forgive. According to scripture, when you don't forgive, you are not forgiven. That's a frightening thought. When you do not forgive others, you too are not forgiven. So that is motivation to let go of whatever it is you're holding on to. So may we all search our hearts today. May we all search our hearts and ask the Father to show us any bitterness, any unforgiveness that we might be holding, any grudges that we may be holding against others or even against ourselves. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, fervent in ruach. Serve the Adon. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation, constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of Yahuwah, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahuwah. 
To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And for the person who overcomes evil with good, woe unto the person who's doing the evil. Woe, because Yahuwah said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So if you do something to hurt or offend another brother or sister, and they choose to forgive, and they choose not to be offended, and they choose to say, Father, you are my defender. I'm not going to try to defend myself. Woe unto that person to whom Yahuwah becomes your enemy. It's just obvious that we're to live right before the Father and before one another, being patient, serving the Most High, serving our Adon Yahusha, Hamashiach, being patient and where we're tried and tested, praying without ceasing, being hospitable, giving to others, being those who are alms givers, blessing those who even persecute you or say negative things about you and not cursing them. Because if you don't defend yourself, the Father will then defend you. If you defend yourself, the Father won't. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We're to live in harmony with one another. Hallelujah. That is the goal. Not offense, harmony. Mark chapter 11. And Yahushua answered them, Have faith in Yahuwah. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does now doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Once again, we're hearing, if you have ought against your brother, forgive so that you can be forgiven. Okay? Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you believe, first of all, and if you are not in unforgiveness. Some of you are having a situation in your lives where your prayers aren't being answered. You don't feel as if you're being heard. Are you holding a grudge? Are you in bitterness? Are you in unforgiveness? If your prayers aren't being answered, you have to ask yourself these questions or ask the Father better yet. Father, am I in unforgiveness? Is there someone that I'm holding something against? Or am I holding something against myself? Am I hating myself and I won't forgive myself because I made a mistake? Show me and help me to let it go. Luke chapter 17. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Oh, family, this is, um, this is quite a bombshell. So if you're sinned against, if you're offended seven times or more in a day, in a day, your obligation, as long as the person repents, says, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Your obligation before the Father is to accept their apology and to forgive them. That's our obligation. We've got to do sometimes what is difficult for us because as human beings, we tend to want to make people pay. I want to make you pay. You hurt me. I want to hurt you too. So if I withhold forgiveness from you, I'm going to make you pay. Not if you love the Father. If you love the Father, you've got to forgive and you've got to do so swiftly. Romans chapter 14. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Yahuwah. For it is written, as I live, saith the Adon, every knee shall bow unto me, and every tongue shall confess to Yahuwah. So then each of us will give an account of himself to Yahuwah. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of our brother, holding 
A grudge is placing a stumbling block before your brother. Because if you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Hear that. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven before the Father. So you have the ability to set them free by letting go of the grudge. Okay? And so if you don't, you're placing a stumbling block to the Father's presence, to the Father's goodness for them in their path by holding on to the grudge. Okay? So it says here, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Okay? So when we hold grudges, we have to make a decision. There's something that happens within us where we feel hurt or angry or bitter and we think to ourselves, I'm not going to forgive this one. Mm -mm, nope. I'm just not. I don't care if they ask me 16 times. I'm not going to forgive. I'm not going to forgive. You're passing a judgment. You're saying in your heart in that moment, this person is unworthy of forgiveness. That is not your place. You don't get to make that decision. Only the father gets to make that kind of decision where that person is then condemned. We don't get to make that kind of decision. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. Another way that we place a stumbling block is by, as I stated before, saying things to people that we wouldn't want said to us or doing things to people we wouldn't want done to us. When you set somebody up to be offended by saying something insensitive on purpose, you're placing a stumbling block before them. There's, there's an account that's going to have to be made for that. So repentance has to come swiftly. You have to repent. You have to go to that person and say, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. Please forgive me. Matayahu, chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the congregation. And if he refuses to listen even to the congregation, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector, meaning somebody on the outside, not even a part of the congregation of Yasharal. Okay? But here's the advice from Yahusha. This is Yahusha speaking. If your brother sins against you, go tell him what he did between the two of you. If he listens and he responds and he repents, you just regained your brother. If he doesn't listen, try again. Take two or three people so that there can be witnesses, okay? If he still doesn't listen, try yet again. Take it to the whole congregation of Yasharal, okay? And if he doesn't listen then, then just say, okay, you're on the outside. You are our anathema. You are on the outside. You are as someone not a part of the covenant because you refused three times to reconcile with your brother, okay? These are the words of the Most High through his son, okay? So this is his will in this situation. He wants us to be reconciled with one another. That's what he wants. Hallelujah. Mashley chapter 24, verse 29. Do not say, I will do to him as he's done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. This is pretty firm and sternly written. In the book of Mashley, do not say, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to pay him back. Don't do that. Don't render evil for evil, but repay evil for good, the scripture teaches us. So if someone hurts you, don't try to get them back in any way. Forgive and allow judgment to be where judgment belongs. The Father will judge. He will do it. In Matayahu chapter 7, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Hallelujah. Whatever you desire for someone to do to you, However you desire for people to speak to you, however you desire for people to treat you, however you want and desire to feel a sense of hospitality, do those things that you desire to feel yourself. 
And if we all treated one another the way we wanted to be treated, we would be a happy, happy, joy, joy group of Hebrew people. If we did that, if we obeyed, I know it's not easy because we come with a lot of built-in traumas. We have been so hurt. We have been so abused. We have been so kicked around and mistreated that sometimes we don't even know how to give a kind word. And yet, we possess the Ruach HaKadosh, the very Ruach of the Father, the very anointing that was on Yahusha is in us. And if it's in us, we should be able to do these things. The Father's not telling us to do things we can't do. That's impossible. He's saying, I know you can do it because my Ruach is in you. And I'm going to cause you to do them because my Ruach will do them in and through you. So he's not calling us to do it on our own. He knows how broken we are. He knows what we've been through. But he also knows that his grace is sufficient for everything, for every circumstance, for everything we've been through. His grace is sufficient. James, Yaakub, chapter 1. Know this, beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of Yahuwah. Therefore, put away all filthiness, all rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Hallelujah. This is not easy to do, obviously. None of these things are easy in our own strength. And if the Father expected us to do these things in our own strength, it would be unreasonable of him. But like I said, he knows that he has given to us his Ruach to help us. He says, with meekness, receive the implanted word. Yahusha is the word. So, and because it is implanted in us, we can be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We can love one another and be doers of the word and not only hearers. It is because the word of Yahuwah has been implanted in us that we can do these things. Yes. Yochanan chapter 16, it reads, when he had said these things, he breathed upon them and said, receive, receive the Ruach, the spirit of holiness. For if you forgive a man's sins, they will be forgiven. And if you hold a man's, they will be held. So once again, if you withhold forgiveness, someone's not going to be forgiven. Okay. It's just not going to happen. But because we have received the spirit of holiness, the Ruach HaKadosh, we can forgive even though in our minds we may want to hold on to a grudge, but in our hearts we know we have to let it go. Hallelujah. So now we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it just speaks to how the Father wants us to be with one another not bearing grudges, but walking toward and with one another in a hub in love. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It never fails. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial Will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child. 
I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love does no ill. Love holds no ill will against a brother or against a sister. So if you have a grudge against a brother or a sister, it's time to let that go. It's time to get into the Father's presence and ask him to help you to let those things go. Hallelujah. Our final verse of scripture for today. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the Torah. Love. Hallelujah. And this is why it's so important to the Most High that we love one another. Because it's a demonstration that the Ruach of holiness, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Ruach of holiness, of Kadoshness, has been implanted in our hearts as a seed. And that, that seed is growing until Mashiach be fully formed in us, until Messiah be fully formed and he is operating in us in perfect love, in perfect harmony, in perfect peace, in perfect obedience, keeping Torah perfectly. And what does that look like? Love. Love is the fulfilling of the whole law. So love does not walk up to somebody and say, boy, you sure have gotten fat. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't make passes at another man's wife. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't take credit for something it didn't do. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't speak harshly when a soft word is needed. Love understands. Love has patience. And love is kind toward those who are weak, meek, lowly, and even those who are brash and braggadocious. Love forgives and love covers a multitude of sins. And this is what we've been called to. We've been called to it because... We have the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the spirit, the Ruach of the Most High Yahuwah, the anointing that was on his son in us. And Yahuwah is love. And ultimately, we are to be conformed to the image of the Father by way of the Son. Hallelujah. And so these things we will do by the power that has been vested to us and is in us. By his power, we will do these things. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for laying it on my heart to do. I thank you, Father, that you are the one who chooses never to hold a grudge. And if anyone was justified in holding one, it would be you if you decided to do so, because we have sinned against you in so many ways. But you command us as you do yourself. You would never tell us to do something or not do something and then do it yourself. You have been so kind and so patient and so forgiving regarding us. And we appreciate you so much, Father. I know that eventually judgment came. Judgment came. Even though you were kind and merciful, eventually the point arrived where you said, that's it. You're not going to have to pay for your sins. 
We give you thanks and praise, Father, that here in the land of captivity, you are once again turning your face toward us and giving us an opportunity to receive you through your son and an opportunity to walk before you and be perfect by walking in love. Father, please forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for all the times we've held grudges against others and even ourselves, failing to forgive ourselves when we didn't meet our own sometimes righteous, sometimes unrighteous standards. Sometimes we strive for perfection, and it's really not. It's pride. It's pride. We want to be the best at everything so that we can laud it over others and say, look at me, I'm better than anybody else. And it's not your perfection. It's man's perfection, and it's pride. Father, show us the difference. Show us the difference between your perfection and the perfection that leads to pride, and that is steeped in pride. Father, help us to walk before you and be like you through your Son. We thank you, Father, every day that we get to come before your throne and speak to you and ahab you and love you and worship you and praise you and honor and esteem you and honor our kinsman redeemer, Yahushua Hamashiach, the son of your right hand, who is so faithful and so beautiful and so wonderful. Hallelujah. We love him because he first loved us. And Father, you loved us before anyone. And we give you esteem, Father, and praise and honor and worship. You alone, Father, are worthy of our worship. We ask you today, Father, that you would forgive those who were holding grudges. Show them and then forgive them and help them to let go and set their brethren, their brothers and sisters and mothers and cousins and uncles and friends and strangers free. Show us the way so that we might walk in it. Help us to let go of the things that have hurt us in the past. Help us to not hold grudges, to not think that we are so high above another person that we would keep them bound in the chains of unforgiveness. Hallelujah. Father, help us to see ourselves in the other. And just as we desire to be forgiven, cause us to forgive. I pray that you'll baruch us in this day. I pray you'll speak to our hearts continually throughout the day. And don't let us forget this message. Let this message ruminate in our minds over and over and over again. Just like people chew the cud of offense. Let us chew the cud of the truth of this word and let us regurgitate it and go over it again and again and again. Who am I holding grudges against? Who am I angry at? Who am I bitter against? Who is getting on my last nerve and I just hadn't told them yet? Father, let us ruminate over this message and receive all that you have for us through it. We love you. We thank you. We esteem you. Thank you, Father, for not giving up on us, even though you could have, and you were completely justified in doing so. We thank you for not giving up on us. Hallelujah. All of these things, all of these praises we offer up to you, Father, and all of these prayers we offer up in the name of Yahushua Hamashiach, our kinsman redeemer, our friend, our Malak, our king, our everything. We thank you for him. We thank you for sending him. And we thank him for being willing, being a willing vessel. He was offended, or he could have been offended, but he chose not to be offended by all the things that were done to him. He chose to love instead. Thank you for hearing this prayer, O oh Father. Aman and Aman. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining me once again on the channel and for another session of our Sunrise Manna. I thank the Father for this message, for laying it in my heart to do so, and I pray that any and all of you who are holding on to bitterness, unforgiveness, malice, wrath, anger, grudges, 
that you will let them go, that you will drop them like a ton of bricks because they're not good for you. It's not good for you to hold on to something that would decide somebody's fate, to decide whether or not someone makes it to the kingdom or not because you choose not to forgive them. That's a heavy burden. I pray that the Father will touch your heart. Just let it go. Hallelujah. May the Most High Yahuwah Baruch and keep you, brothers and sisters. Bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, shalom, peace in every area of life. And may you continually walk before the Most High and be perfect by the power of that has been vested and invested in you by the Ruach HaKadosh, who is the spirit, the Ruach of holiness, of Kadoshness, the Ruach of the Father and the Son. All praises to the Most High Yahuwah. All praises. Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters.